Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our second episode of uh, Azure Thursdays from the Letterkenny Microsoft User Group. Uh, my name is Ewan Durant. Um, today, along with my colleagues Richard, Ray, Nathan, and Valin, we'll be talking to you about Azure DevOps. Um, before we continue, we're still learning this uh, Microsoft Teams broadcasting tool. So I'm just going to quickly ask my colleagues if uh, I am in fact going out over the stream. Just give us a moment there, please. Yeah, I, c I can hear you fine, Yun, and I can see your desktop. Awesome. And can you see me? Um, I can see you at the bottom of the screen, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so now that I've spoken to a ghost that uh, my audience couldn't hear, uh, we're going to tell you today about Microsoft Azure DevOps. Uh, before we get to the deep dive of the actual technology, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of where it came from and where you, how you use it and what it's good for. Um, in terms of our agenda, I'm going to be show, telling you quickly about Azure DevOps. Then we'll be going to Rich to tell you about boards, uh, Nathan will be telling you about repos, Ray will tell you about pipelines, and then we have a bit of a buffer at the end for any Q&A. Uh, we will be stopping at uh, 8 o'clock, not 7.10, so don't worry, we're not uh, dropping off in 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, we are trying to get more interactive, so there's a Q&A on this uh, uh, session. Please, you'll see there are three questions there reflecting your level of um, experience with Azure DevOps. Please feel free to link, uh, click on the like links in those uh, questions just so we can get a feel for who's on the call. Uh, we do intend to be doing more of these and more regularly. It's been a while since our last one. Um, and if there's anybody out there who wants to participate, please get in touch with us via Meetup or via um, email and just let us know what you what you want to come and present. You know, we're all about the community and you're welcome to join. Thank you very much. We have a code of conduct. Um, we won't be nasty to you. You're not allowed to be nasty to each other or to us. Great. Everybody happy with that? Um, so if you drop into uh, Azure DevOps, um, I've personally been working with the Microsoft tool stack for a good long while. I started working with um, Visual Studio.net in 2003. Um, and I've seen the evolution of the tools from where they started in 1997, where they had SourceF and Visual Studio, which were good tools, but you know they weren't, they weren't what they are today. Um, then in 2005, Microsoft came out with Visual Studio Team System. Um, that started to be a very good tool. You know, it integrated source control, build, and code management, um, and IDEs. It was integrated into the IDE. Uh, when they they really started hitting their stride when they got to Microsoft Team Foundation Server, where in 2013 they introduced Git source control into T, uh, TFS 2013. And then through the evolution of something they called Visual Studio Team Ser Teams Online and then Visual Studio Team Services, they eventually rebranded to Azure DevOps and they released Visual Studio Code over the past couple of years. And that really has been a game changer in terms of how integrated and how capable the tooling is. Um, so we've got a long history of, of development tools from Microsoft and um, I'm not really sure who's on the course. I don't know your, your uh, familiarity with uh, you know commercial software uh, practices and, and tooling. So I just prepared this slide to explain at a high level, you know, if you're a software team, how do you work together? Um, and then in the next slide, I'll show you how Azure DevOps supports these activities. So firstly, a software team always starts with a problem, a business problem. You know, a business is spending money on hiring software devs and uh, you know, prepare, issuing you with the nicest laptops and giving you fantastic tooling like Azure DevOps. So, you know, the least you can do is listen to business and find out what is it that they need fixed, right? What is their organizational need? Um, so once you have that, you have the list of functionality that you're going to deliver. Then you as a team have to agree, how are you going to deliver what the business has asked you to deliver? Um, and to do that, you normally would take your stories or your functions or your capabilities, however you're organizing your work, and you then build down a, ta a list of tasks to do to achieve those outcomes. You'll see how Azure DevOps does that later. Uh, next up, uh, we're all now going to actually do the work to solve these problems and to build whatever needs to be built and um, you know get it get it ready for delivery. Um, after we've built 
uh, the software, we'll have a little governance layer there to say, you know, we have to ensure that the work that we've done was done the way we agreed. It was what we agreed we would do. It was done according to any rules that we have and things we've done now haven't broken anything from before. That's a very, very common problem that um, you build this fantastic feature, but you don't realize that it's broken two, three other features that you built before. And then once you've ensured that everything's still OK, then you have to get uh, the work that you've now built into the hands of your users. Now, the good news is that Azure DevOps supports all of these activities very, very capably. Um, how it does that is it uses this suite of independent tools. So if you're looking at the uh, at this slide on the left hand side, there's Azure boards. In Azure boards, you plan your work in terms of what are we going to do? You also plan your work in terms of how are we going to do it? So you create your stories and you create your tasks against those stories. In Azure repos, you write your code. You can use Visual Studio 2019. Uh, you can use Visual Studio code. The, com the free version of Visual Studio 2019 is brilliant for .NET development. Uh, Visual Studio Code, which is free and open source, is brilliant for everything else. If you're working in Python, if you're working in JavaScript, um, it is a great, great tool. Um, next up, you now take the code that you've written into your repo and you have a build pipeline on top of that. So uh, Azure Pipelines gives you the capability to build your code, to validate it against your standards, and then to run a suite of tests uh, against the code to make sure that the code does, still does what it did before and the new code does what you want. Um, Azure DevOps also has the capability to take those build artifacts and to store them inside a little storage place in Azure DevOps. Next up, once you build your code, someone tests it. There's still manual testing involved in many software uh, development activities. It should be mentioned that, um, you know, with the rise of automation, the testing, manual testing is decreasing, but it's still a very important part of your life cycle because you need to plan uh, your tests and execute them. But most importantly, you need to do exploratory testing because you will automate certain tests, but a user will click on things that you never could have thought they would click on. And that then um, gives you the opportunity for them to find bugs that flow back into the boards. So if your test plan fails, it flows back into the board as a bug that you can fix. If your pipeline fails, that flows back into the board as a bug. It's possible to set it up automatically that when your build fails, you create a, um, a bug automatically on the board. Um, and then finally, there's another flavor of Azure pipelines, which is the release pipelines. And that takes your stored artifacts and deploys them onto the uh, whatever the target environment is we can run your code. Um, release pipeline has massive different um, capabilities. You can do uh, simple deployments. You have a lot of options for deploying to Azure. It is Azure DevOps after all. Um, and there are more sophisticated capabilities. There's lots of in material out there on how to implement blue-green deploys with Azure Pipelines, how Microsoft uses Azure Pipelines to deploy uh, their products. So, you know, if Microsoft with their enormous teams can use this tool, um, I've worked on tiny teams that can that use this tool very successfully. It's pretty much the, a perfect, perfect way for you to plan, build, test, and release any code that you'd like. That's the very high level 10,000 foot overview of the tools. Um, up next is going to be Richard talking to you about boards. After that, Nathan will talk to you about repos and then Ray will talk to you about pipelines. Rich, over to you. Thanks, Ewan. I'm just going to wait until I'm switched live. There we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Fisher. I'm going to be speaking to you today about Azure Boards. Um, like you and mentioned, it's the what you're doing and how uh, you actually manage uh, the work that you are doing. So let's jump straight in and let's go have a look at what Microsoft. Um, actually, wait, let me just share my screen first. That would help. OK. Uh, let's just jump straight in and let's see what Microsoft uh, says about Azure boards. Um, so if you go to Azure Microsoft and you go to uh, DevOps boards, um, you can go here and cre create a, um, a free account or you could link up to your existing um, GitHub repos. So track work with Kanban boards, backlogs, team dashboards and custom reporting. 
um, connect from an idea right through to release. Um, it's Scrum ready, built in insights, so you can run queries on your work and build uh, nice visualizations uh, using charts and uh, putting them to dashboards. Uh, so if you're already using GitHub, um, Boards integrates nicely with that. Uh, it's a proven productivity tool. You can create these custom dashboards, like I mentioned. Um, you can choose multiple different workflows, and you can use it with your favorite tools like um, Teams or Slack. And there are thousands of extensions that you can um, actually link up with um, into your Azure boards as well. So let's jump straight into Azure boards. Um, I do apologize if I'm running a little bit fast. Um, I wanted to cover as much as I can in my 15 minute slot. Um, so if we click into boards, we can see um, a number of views here. We have work items, boards, backlogs, sprints, queries, and plans. If we click into work items, what you'll see here is a list of all the work items that are linked to this project that um, I'm in at the moment. Um, what you can do is you can filter this um, by a number of scopes here. You can go create new work. You can open up uh, the query window and, and create a custom query. Uh, you can change the columns uh, as you see it here. Uh, you can import work items if you got them in a specific uh, structure in a CSV. If we go over to the left here and look at boards and backlogs. Now boards and backlogs are just two different views of the same work item. So if we click, click into boards, over here you select your team. If I click this drop down, you'll see there's multiple teams here linked to this project. And I need to select a team to get a view of that team's board. And if I click here, view as backlog, that'll just take me to, to this um, view over here which shows all the work items um, in a list. Um, I will be speaking later on customizing uh, these boards. If we move further down, we have sprints. Now, what your sprints are, it's taking the work that is in your, your team's backlog, and it's taking that work and splitting it up into multiple sprints um, that will be completed um, over time. And this view actually shows you, if you click on it, it'll open up the, um, let me just go in there. The YAML team. It'll open up to your, your current sprint. So if you look at this drop down, we can select whatever sprint you want to uh, view, uh, but the default is your current. Um, it'll show a list of work um, that needs to be completed in the sprint, and you'll be able to go and create your tasks um, that, that are are linked to these product backlog items, and you can also move your your tasks from the different statuses from to do, in progress, and done. The next view is queries. Over here, you can go and create a custom query. I've created one here called New Bugs, and if we go and edit it, very simple, straightforward. It'll give you a list of conditions. So we'll have yeah, I've selected work item as the field, and I've said I want to see all bugs and I've selected the, the field called state, and I want to see all bugs in the new state. And at the bottom here, you'll see, um, you get a, a view on, on the results of your query. Um, and these can, can be created into charts. So once you've created your query, you can go select the type of chart you want, and you can also go and add that to um, a dashboard for your team if you want as well. The final view under boards is plans. Now, you've got all this, this work that has been um, stored in your backlogs and you're busy with and you've structured your, your, your sprints that you're wanting to complete. What plans does is it visualizes the roadmap of the work um, that you're going to complete over time. Um, so it gives you a nice a single view. And the one nice thing as well is it allows you to add these uh, red markers, which are milestones. So you can have multiple milestones um, across your uh, release roadmap. Um, just to make sure that you're actually on track. Okay, so that's just a brief overview of boards. Let's jump into some customization. Before I do that, I just want to jump back into Microsoft's documentation and let's have a look at the processes um, that you can create your project under. So there are four different processes. You have basic, agile, scrum, and CMMI. 
Now, each of these processes has its own taxonomy um, and it has its own workflows linked to it. So if we look at basic, it's made up of epics, issues and tasks. If we go to agile, we now have a portfolio level, which is epics and features. And the work is broken down into user stories and tasks linked to that um, or bugs and tasks and then issues as well. Then the, the scrum process and the CMMI. Now CMMI is, is um, if you're following a more traditional process, um, I would suggest you use CMMI because it gives you these added, um, this added level of support, which is around change management issues, um, doing reviews and managing the risk. So let's jump back into Azure boards and see how we can customize our project to actually um, be linked to one of these processes. So if we click here under settings, we back in and we go to project configuration. You'll see on the top here, it says this project is currently using YAML custom process. So that's one of I created previously, just because we don't have that much time uh, with this session. And it says that to customize your work item types, go to this link. So let's click on that. And that'll open up the, the custom process that I have created. But before I go into that, let's look at all the processes. Here's the basic Agile, Scrum and CMMI, like I, I took you through. And over here, you'll see I've created an inherited process from Scrum called YAML custom process. Now, I could have done it with any one of these processes. So if I had to go and click on this three dots, I could go and create an inherited process from this um, Agile process, do the customization and go and link it to um, a project that, that I wanted uh, to follow that process. So let's click into the YAML custom process and see what changes you can actually make. So the first um, changes you can look at making are to your work items. Now I've gone and already created a, a new work item called objective. And the reason why I did that is uh, I wanted a higher level of portfolio management. So I'm now going to have objective, epic and feature to manage my um, portfolio level. But you can go in here and go and create uh, any type of um, work item you want. I know one that's that's popular is um, a SPAC. A lot of agile teams do research on on on, on certain work and technologies. Um, so you can go in here, click on the new work item, go create that type and then um, actually customize um, the, the design of, of that specific work, work item as well. So let's look at features. If I look at this feature now, this, this is the default layout of the feature. Now, I know that a lot of teams work with um, software that the salespeople uh, are using to sell a product. Now that sales platform will have an order number and you would want that order number to flow into your, um, your board so you can actually track um, the, from the original order of the customer right through to the implementation of the work that you're actually rolling out. So I'm gonna go and create a new field, but I'm gonna create it under, let me just drop this down. I'm gonna create it under details. And I'm going to add a new field and I'm going to call it order number. And I'm going to give it a type of integer. And I'm going to give it a description of sales order number. List. Uh, -da -da -da. Let's look at the options. Uh, I want it as a required field. Um, so every time a new feature is created, um, you're gonna, the, the person creating it's gonna have to put in the order number. And let's put in a default link. And if we look at the layout, order number, details in that group. Yep, what don't you like? Full name is already used. It's the full name then. Let's add that field. Okay, so now that the field is added under details, if I had to go back, um, uh, actually, let's just move this up. I don't want it right at the bottom. I want it at the top of details. There we go, good. Now, if we go back to the project and we go to parts YAML, and I come to boards. And 
And if I filter on features and I click into a feature, we should see that order number appear there if my PC decides to work. Okay, let's filter on features. Let's open up a feature. And if everything worked well, we should see, there we go, order number and default uh, four nines. So that's really nice where you can customize the work items and the fields that are displayed in those work items. And you can customize it to your business and the process that your business is, um, is actually following. Okay. So that's customizing um, your, your processes and linking it to, to a project. What I want to go into now is looking at customization of these um, of your board. Let's just go hop back into the documentation. If you look here, configure and customize Azure boards. You can do customization at the project level, the team level. Um, you can customize the different work items and the portfolio backlogs. So there's a whole bunch of customization that you can do here, and I suggest you you go to this link um, under Docs and look at Configure, Customize um, Azure DevOps, and go through and have a look at all the different customization you can do there. For this, what I'm going to do is show you some of the customization. Actually, let's go back to backlog items. I'm going to show you some of the customization that um, I generally like to do on um, my boards. So if we look at the field of the product backlog item, what I can do here is I can decide what reflects actually on this card over here. So if we look at the moment, we've got the ID, uh, we've got show assigned to as, we'll see that over there. If we scroll You're on down. 15 minutes, Rich. Am I on 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay, then let me just quickly do one styling. Um, so we can change uh, how the card appears. We can do some styling. I just want to add one rule here quickly. Um, let's call this rule locked. And let's just make this bigger. I want to select red rule criteria. Da, 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 da. That's fine. Let's go tag colors. Just busy rushing through this quickly. Boom, boom, boom. Why didn't it like that? Is there already a blocked? I think you need to uh, specify, yeah, let's say tags. Let's say contains blocked. Let's save that. And then very quickly, I just wanted to show you, yeah, if we had to go into one of these and we had to go and add a tag blocked, we should magically see it turn red on the board. There we go. And that's actually quite nice so you can visualize um, certain stories if they're in a specific state and they need attention. Um, you can go and do the styling to the cards. So that's my story. Um, I'm probably about a minute over. Thank you very much for listening and I'm going to hand over to Nathan and he's going to speak to you about repos. Thanks guys. Thanks Richard. Uh So I'm just did I share the right thing? I think we're still seeing Richard's. Yeah, I'm still live. Live. Yeah. Okay. So Richard, you can I, I, I can do a show and dance if you want. <laughs> Only if you do yeah. <laughs> So just let me know if you can see anything. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. can. 
Uh, okay. Hey all, uh, thanks Richard uh, for a wonderful session uh, and I'll be covering you about the Azure repos. So before that, I'll give you an uh, overview of what I'm trying to cover. So Azure repos. Uh, Azure uh, repos is nothing but it's a version control system uh, built on top of uh, Git. Uh, that's a standard distributed version control being used by GitHub and uh, Bitbucket and all those uh, uh, different uh, uh, products, right? So Azure repos is uh, uh, built in uh, um, it repo available as part of the Azure DevOps. And I'll be covering about uh, uh, different options available in the uh, Azure repos, uh, how you can uh, integrate the code into the Azure repo, uh, how you can uh, uh, implement the quality gates in the, the, the different branches, how you can uh, issue a pull request, how do you or do the code review uh, using the Azure uh, Azure repos and uh, how do you apply different policies in different branches and all those aspects. Okay, so that you can control your uh, version control. So I'll uh, quickly uh, go and uh, start with the demo. So if you if you are in the Azure DevOps uh, for the first time, you will see you might have uh, seen the, an overview of screen and uh, boards. Then next is the Azure repos. Okay, so. Uh, typically in uh, Azure DevOps, you can create two type of uh, version control systems. One is uh, using the older uh, EFSPC and uh, uh, other is using the Git. Okay, uh, by default, when it is using the Git, you may see the, the uh, uh, different uh, options uh, for creating multiple repos and uh, uh, managing the repository, all those aspects. Okay, so for the interest of the demo, we have a predefined code already committed. And uh, this was uh, um, uh, uh, part of the parts unlimited project that was used for uh, um, most of the Microsoft demos. So you can see, uh, you can view the files here in a repo and you, uh, you can view the different aspects. If you want to manually up upload any file into the repo, you can do here. And uh, you can browse uh, through the, uh, the commit history and uh, you can see uh, the different push uh, happen to each branch. So for, for the demo purpose, I created a my demo branch from the master. So I'll, I'll talk about the branches. So the branches is uh, a way of, you know, of getting started with the development. Ideally, each developers uh, can create their own branch from the a master branch, and then they can co uh, continue working on it and they can commit their code uh, uh, into the and, the and their specific branch, and once they may uh, they feel that okay, their functionality is complete, they can um, um, issue a pull request to merge the code into uh, uh, the master. So pull request is a, a standard way of uh, issuing uh, a changes to the uh, the uh, uh, branch, and uh, sometimes there are chances that developer may uh, uh, may. Uh, uh, commit improper code, right? So you had to control that. So that's where we have something called uh, the the branch policies. Okay, so the branch policies is where you, using which you will protect your branch. So you can uh, specify uh, the code reviewing policy here. So how many uh, reviewers are required? So for example, if you are working on a larger team and you need to have a team lead and uh, uh, an associate need and needs to review your code, so you can mention minimum two reviewers required and you you uh, some of these are self-explanatory it won't allow you if you check this you can allow your own pull request uh, but ideally in a software development world we won't allow uh, individual who are making the pull request to approve it okay and uh, the other thing is uh, typical work item so you have seen in the on the boards we'll uh, start with the creating the story and task and everything right so it should, there you can specify that there should be a defined work item with each uh, each pull request so that uh, if, if you if it is mandatory you can make it or if you want to make it optional you can so these are all best to have or anything and uh, the check for command resolution so this is typically when uh, somebody issues a pull request uh, and uh, then uh, uh, a team lead or a, a, a peer a reviewer actually reviews the code and they put some comments uh, regarding your uh, uh, code review right so then if you want to uh, uh, you want to make sure that all those policy requirements, uh, the comments are resolved, right? So um, as a developer, you will have to actually again fix those issues and commit back and then 
marketers are resolved. So then only you can uh, merge it back to the master. Then again, uh, you can define different merge types. You can specify the build validation. So a, a typical uh, practice is to have a pre-flight build the running before uh, uh, this uh, the code can be merged to ensure that uh, the code is not in a broken state. Okay, so typically it, uh, it includes uh, a, a complete build and then a set of unit tests will be ran against uh, uh, your code. And uh, if uh, all the, the, the criteria are met, right? So the code, uh, the unit test coverage of certain uh, uh, percentage and all those things are met, then only um, uh, some, even if somebody approves, it can go further. So that's why we will add uh, pre-merging uh, build validation policy here. And here again, you can uh, apply policy based on different paths. So for, for example, you have a front end code in one folder and back end code in another folder and a DevOps specific code in another folder. And if you want to specify uh, the build policy specific to a path filter, you can specify here. So for example, my code, DevOps code is in the DevOps folder. Sorry, uh, ops folder. Then if I want to validate uh, 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 with another pipeline, uh, uh, build a pipeline, then we can do that as well. And you can specify uh, when the build should expect. Typical case, we uh, put it 12 hours or 24 hours, so that by next day, anybody can review and approve them. Uh, otherwise, they are taken manually. And, the, and uh, if you have, uh, if you need certain uh, approvals from third party systems, right? For example, service now or uh, those kind of things. So, for example, if it is going to the production, right? Uh, then um, it needs to have a change ticket or something created in the service now or those cases. And that uh, and uh, once the change ticket needs to be approved by certain third parties, uh, sorry, certain part, um, certain department or uh, 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 approvers, right? So then uh, you can uh, and then you can use that status policy where you can uh, specify the API URL where that needs to be uh, checked. And uh, you can automatically add the code reviewers uh, uh, based on the different paths. For example, you can have a uh, unit test uh, or the, the automation test related code uh, can be reviewed by a QA team, right? So uh, then you specify the automation code in a uh, automation specific folder and you put the path filter here and uh, then you specify the, the QA approver uh, here, then they only they will be able to uh, they will be automatically assigned for the review. And if it is a development uh, branch, so for example, if it is a source folder, any changes to the source folder, right? So, sorry, uh, it should be dev approver. Uh, if I create, you know, I don't have a, a, a reviewer created here. So, typically, if I specify in the source and I say, okay, I need and need them to approve it, right? So then it's you know, automatically approve that. Uh, sorry, uh, automatically assign a uh, uh, code reviewer. Okay, so then uh, once you set all these aspects right, so then um, next onwards, uh, when somebody makes a uh, wants to merge the code, right? So for example, I have uh, I have created a sample uh, branch here, and I'm trying to commit some changes here. I just uh, what I did is. Uh, just created a readme file and added some, some text here into that branch and I'm committing it, okay? And uh, now what I'm trying to do is create a pull request and uh, I'm saying, okay, so the reviewer uh, can be tuned uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is a work item. So one of the user stories or tasks that I can uh, select uh, as a developer and then if I want to add specific tags, right, 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 it is a, it is for the, some uh, read me uh, feature or those kind of things. And you also can see how many uh, you know, files change the commits and all those things and they uh, issue a pull request. Okay, so now you have the pull request issued as a, de a developer and uh, as a code reviewer, right? So once the UN comes here, UN can actually, uh, 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 so uh, come and uh, uh, comment on about this file. So that's why uh, that's where the, he will come here and say, okay, here is the code review command he is adding. Uh, I'm just maybe picking what he is going to do. So uh, please add some more details. Right? And commented that part. So now uh, this issue is active. Okay. 
So once I resolve this as a developer, I resolve this uh, uh, code review comments, right? Then only I can uh, merge the code back to the branch. So it won't uh, allow me. So that's why it is showing zero of uh, one comment. So for example, now if I go here and say that, okay, it is in resolve state. Now all the comments are in resolve state. I have a, uh, a pre-flight build is running. So somehow the, the uh yeah so even reviewed and uh marked it there now there is a free flight running a okay i'm not sure this uh build will work or not because i haven't checked it so then once a developer he wants to, uh, to commit the code back to the uh, the master right so he can specify the Set auto complete so as soon as when somebody approves the code, right? So that can get met. So this is how you will do the code review uh, uh, or the pull request and the code review part using the uh, Azure repos. Okay? And uh, see if you look at the required checks, work item uh, must be linked, it, it is succeeded and uh, uh, completed associate. So these are some options available. So if you want to mark the story as complete. And if you want to apply different merge types, you can. So somehow the build is failing. Uh, that's okay. So what we can do is we can go to the branch uh, like this. I can remove this requirement. Okay. Uh, for the sake of uh, pull request completion. Okay. Now I go to my pull request. Now I click on complete. Right. So this will get merged into the master. Okay, so if I you uh, approve, uh, yeah, you approved and the pull request uh, completed, and the code gets merged into the master. Now, if I go back to my master branch, so I can see my changes incorporated, and so you can see changes are incorporated, right? So this uh, this is how. And if you want to, as a developer, if you want to again create a new branch for your development, you can click on create a branch you can do it by command also typical command for git and if you want to link that branch to a work item you can do that from here so this is a basic level uh, a branch uh, specific uh, controls you can do uh, uh, to secure your repo now the other things you can do is uh, so you have one repo here right so if you want more than one repo for uh, your uh, your one uh, your project in uh, azure Do, right so you can actually click on new repository here and this is one way you can set the policies again you're at 15 so minutes, it, I yeah I, i'm just finishing so this is how you will set the policies uh, the global policies and everything and uh, you have your uh, or if you want to uh, set policies specific to each rep uh, each repo you can do that as well and if you want to do it in global uh, level uh, for all the repositories within that project, you can set these policies here. You can specify the security and you can specify the options and all those aspects. Okay. And again, the cross repo policies, the same thing that we have done in a, for each individual branches. You can do it in a more streamlined manner for all the branches. So you can specify the branch pattern and then, uh, uh, for example, I'm specifying master okay, and create then it will show me the same steps as I did it in the first part. So that's a uh, uh, that's all about the uh, Azure repos. It's a very good uh, uh, integrated um, version control available as part of the Azure DevOps, and you would be using the standard Git uh, distributed uh, version control. You don't need to look for any Azure DevOps specific uh, uh, Git tools uh, or version control tools to manage or commit your code from your local workstation. So you can simply use your old uh, Git, uh, Git for Windows or Tortoise Git and all those clients or even the Visual Studio directly. So that's all uh, from my side. Thank you all. Hey, you can take it forward. All righty, I'm going to share my screen. If somebody make me, somebody can make me live, that'd be great. Yeah, I think you're live, right? All right, thank you. OK, cheers, Nathan, for taking us through the repos. Uh, what I'm going to be 
talking about now for the next few minutes is Azure Pipelines. And there's qu quite a fair bit in the pipelines. I'm unlikely to cover everything in 15 minutes, but what I'm hoping that you will get out of this is just how easy it is to set up and a build and release using Azure DevOps. And it's really this section, I think, that the, the DevOps aspect of Azure DevOps come to life. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're working our way through the, the left-hand navigation here, doing the boards, the repos. Now we're onto the, the pipeline piece. So the work has been done. We have our code and it's been reviewed, and now we're looking to try to get it built and deployed somewhere. I'm going to be focusing on these two sections, specifically the pipeline section and the releases. Now, up until very recently, the, this pipeline section was was called was referred to as the build section. Uh, it's a little bit confusing now because we have got a, a pipelines header followed immediately by another pipelines, but uh, it looked it made a bit more sense when this was called builds. Uh, the reason it's now called pipelines is because they've now released uh, YAML pipelines where you can not only do a build, but you can also do your deployments and releases from here as well. Uh, so that's why they've, they've renamed it as a pipeline. Uh, I have a project in here. It is a little HTML5 game. It's based on a library called PhaserJS, and I've taken the, the little startup tutorial that comes along with Phaser, and I've made a, a, a multiplayer version of that. And I have it sitting here in uh, this project as a repo. And what I'm going to do is I have set up a build and release, and I'll take you through how I set that up. So to see my build, I'm in here under the pipeline section. And I can see I've got one pipeline set up. And if I click into it, I can see a, a history of the, the, the builds that I've done with this. And if I click on edit, you'll see that this has been powered from a YAML file. And it looks like there's a, a lot of stuff in here, but if you break it down by section by section, this YAML file is actually quite small in comparison to ones that you might use in a, in a real world production uh, scenario. You can see that the first thing that I have listed here is which branch to trigger this particular build from. So I just have this set up quite simply to, to build whenever a, a change has been committed to the, the master branch in the repo. I've then specified which um, VM that I want Azure DevOps to spin up and run the, the, the build using. So in this instance, I'm building a, a node application. So I'm just using the, the latest Ubuntu images they have. But you can see in the documentation, there's uh, other agents that you can specify if you're building a .NET application. For example, you might want to select a, a Windows machine or server. The second step that I'm, I have then in my YAML file is I'm just telling the agent to um, install Node.js and a particular version of it. Uh, and then immediately followed by doing an NPM install to pull down the latest packages that's in my code base. Uh, and then the last two steps are I'm simply zipping all the artifacts that are a part of my code and deploying them or dropping them to the to the, the stage and area where my release will then pick it up. You don't have to know these uh, the syntax off by heart. Uh, you have the, the tasks here on your the right hand side and you can go through here for example and just click click on one of these and click add and it will drag over the syntax for you and you can just fill in the parameters so there's a lot more stuff that i could do in here if, if i wanted uh, because i'm building my application i may want to run some uh, unit tests or uh, user acceptance test that I might have um, in here, or I may want to run some code, static code analysis, to just to, to gauge that everything is okay. So you can build up a lot of tasks in here that aren't just strictly building the code and preparing it for deployment. But for the sake of simplicity for this one, I'm just building it and dropping it. Once this is then built and dropped, 
I have then configured a release pipeline in here. So I have one release called game deployment. I've done this is the history of it so far. So I've done eight releases. You can see that one of them had failed release four and I can see the environments that are included in this deployment. So I have a dev and I've got a production environment. If I click on edit. You'll see that when you're setting this up, the first thing you, you set is you tell it, well, what am I deploying? So I have this pointed to the, the artifacts, the drop location of my master branch for the code base. So whenever a build has been built using that branch, using the master branch, it's going to be triggered off whatever is released from that. And you can see I have two uh, serial releases here, one going to a dev environment and a production environment. And for this case, my dev and production, they are both web applications in Azure. So this is the Azure portal. And I have a resource group here with that has two web applications in them, a dev application and a production application. And as I am deploying to an Azure web app, if I look at the task that I have set up, I have very simply used the, the Azure App Service deployment web app. Now there's a number of other tasks that you can include in here. Uh, if you're not deploying to Azure, uh, you can uh, deploy to wherever your production or your dev environments are, and you can even run some deployment scripts that may live as part of your source control. So for example, the, the YAML file that I created in my pipeline that lives in my master branch, so it's, it's a part of the source control. And as part of that, I may also have some deployments or release scripts that I may want to reference in here that will deploy to wherever my app needs to go. This is a, it's a very simple example. It's only doing one task, but in a proper production scenario, you will have likely have uh, numerous tasks in here. Uh, for example, if I wanted to make this a, a little better, what I might do is my first task might go off and check that my app service actually exists in Azure before it attempts to deploy it. Um, because I, I know it exists, I just have it in here to deploy straight to that location. But it's quite common that you may want to tear down your environment, uh, at which point your deployment pipeline could spin that up again if it's checking that it exists. And if it doesn't exist, it may set it up. So I have done a couple of deployments already and my app is accessible, but when I was testing it on my own machine here uh, run on localhost, I realized there was two problems with what I had deployed. The first problem is if you look at the bottom left here, there is a misspelling on the word leader. And the second issue which is more concerning is that when all these stars are collected, it is meant to regenerate them, but in this case it doesn't, so there's nothing for me to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly make a change to this code. I'm going to commit it to the repo, and I'm going to show you what that build and release does once I have that kicked off. So here I am over in Visual Studio Code, and the first thing I'm going to fix is the problem for the stars not coming back. And I'll comment that line. And then in here, I'm going to fix the spell mistake. Now I'm going to put in uh, fixed issues. I'm going to commit that locally, and then I will sync that up to the server. Once this completes, uh, I will switch back to the Azure DevOps screen where we will see that because I have the trigger on this to automatically build, we'll see that a build is already in progress. And it usually takes around 11 seconds or so. If I click in here, I can monitor the progress of it. I can see what it's doing. 
we can see it's nearly finished here. It's done my uh, installation of Node on the agent. It's done an NPM install. It's packaged up the artifacts and it's published it. And now it's just doing some uh, post, uh, post build tasks. That is now completed. I also have my release pipeline to automatically deploy once a successful build has happened on that branch. So we can see already that it's doing release number nine and it's busy deploying to the dev environment. Now, what I've also set up here is a post, a pre-deployment approval step. So in here, it's very easy to configure users or people to be uh, approvers before something gets released to a particular environment. So in this scenario, you can see it's, con it's successfully uh, completed the deployment to dev, but before it can go to the production deployment, it needs my approval. So I'm going to put in here. Once that is carried out, the deployment to the production environment then can proceed. So now it's queued up and it's ready to go. Uh, the agent's been spun up and it's now doing the deployment. And again, like the, the, the build task, I can come in here and I can see what it's doing. So I can see it's initialized the job, downloaded the artifacts that my build had created and is now deploying to the app service. Now, once this is all completed, we should be able to hit this URL. And I'm going to copy this and put it in to the chat because it is a multiplayer HTML5 game. So if anyone is on a computer, they can hit this link and they can join in. Switch back here and I can see that my release to production has completed. I bring back this. I can see nothing's happened. There we go. You can see there's a few people in here already. And you'll notice the spelling mistake has been corrected in the bottom left. And when the stars are collected, they replenish again. So my change has been successfully built and deployed, uh, in, including having a pre-deployment approval git on the production environment. Now on the, the other sections then, so I, I touched on the, the pipelines, which is the builds uh, and the releases section. There are a couple of other sections under here, environments, library and task groups. Um, the environment section allows you to define a dev QA or production environment that you wish to share across multiple applications or multiple projects in here in Azure DevOps. Uh, this is useful if you have a number of pro projects that are deploying to the same location and instead of each of them defining what that environment is, or where it lives, that you define it up front once and you're able to share it across so that if it ever changes, the those projects don't have to worry about updating them. Similarly, the, the library section allows you to create a collection of variables that you may use throughout a build or release. Uh, these can be shared again uh, across multiple projects. Um, and it, it's very useful if your project is relying on some uh, configurable variables and you don't want to have every project maintaining a copy of the same stuff that you would want to maybe define those up front and have them shared across. All in all, uh, that was it's quite a, a simple build and release but it's, it's also very simple to achieve uh, with very little experience. Uh, I have prior experience using Azure DevOps and Azure pipelines. Um, I was relatively new to the, the YAML uh, build pipelines, but I think with some uh, technical background, it, it would only take maybe an hour or so to, to configure something like that. With experience, it can take up to you know maybe four or five minutes just to configure something like that. So it's very, very simple to configure these uh, high quality build and release pipelines. And 
uh, again, very useful because you can also have a lot of this as YAML files or as deployment scripts that live in your source code. So they can be like an equal citizen to the actual source code as well. So you get all the, the uh, peer review approval gates that you would have with, with normal code. And I think that concludes everything that I wanted to show. Uh, I know we're, we're running up on the hour and we want to leave some time for some questions. So with that, I will leave it and uh, we'll hand it back over to our host to take any questions if you have any. Hi Ray. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the uh, great session. Uh, actually, we have only one question that has come up. Uh, it is like, is there any uh, on-premise version of Azure DevOps available? Um, you and you can uh, take it on. Thank you, Zubin. Um, yeah, I, I did on say in the text there that there is an on-premises version. Um, Azure DevOps online server, <laughs> the online version evolved out of Microsoft's um, on-premises tool, Team Foundation Server. So they kept on updating Team Foundation Server and they now have an on-premises version of that, which is very similar to um, the version that we've been looking at tonight. And that's called Azure DevOps Server. And um, to totally avoid any kind of confusion between the products, they've called the online version Azure DevOps Services and the, and the, the uh, on-prem version is Azure DevOps Server. So there's a lot of confusion about these tools, but there is an on-premises version, there's a cloud version, and they, um, they are very similar. There are some minor differences in capability, but the on-premises version is very much a viable option also. So I think uh, that's the end of our evening of Azure DevOps. Thank you very much, everybody who joined. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening.